Good afternoon. We uh, continue with the uh, series of our lectures on Six Sigma. We have a special topic today. This has to do with uh, quality and services. Almost two third of our economy today is uh, driven by various forms of services, and uh, there are many examples. If you see the kind of people who are involved in uh, providing services, we have people in healthcare. They certainly are there, and uh, they have to make sure that the hospitals work correctly, the medical practitioners, they get their help, dentistry, eye care, all of these are, they fall in the category of service provision in the area of healthcare. Then we have professional services, that's also a very large area in our economy, accounters, accounting, legal, architectural work, even IT, all this again, all these again fall under the uh, umbrella of professional services. Then we've got financial services, which are like banking, investment, advising, insurance, and so on. These are also categorized now under services. Hospitality, this has become a new sort of area. This is a very large area that has certainly grown. And because of uh, movement of people, a lot of transactions taking place overseas and so on, people are required to travel. And there are also lifestyles are changing. A lot of people, they eat out. Therefore, we've got restaurant businesses. We've got hotels and motels. A lot of arrangements are there for bread and breakfast type of thing. Then ski, resort, rafting, and number of other tourist services, these all come, come under hospitality. That's like another area where you got uh, services involved. Travel, and uh, that would be like airlines, for example, that's like a large area where again, we have uh, people who are engaged in providing services. Travel agencies, they do a marvelous job many times. And of course, sometimes they foul up. Theme parks, they also come under services. And many other services which you probably do not even notice, for example, hairstyling, pest control, plumbing, lawn maintenance, counseling services, and health care. These are also categorized under services. And uh, in fact, each of these uh, business entities would survive only if customers come back to them. Otherwise, they would not be there. So this is something that's very important for us to realize. Services exist because there are customers. And service is something where there is instant delivery. If you see the uh, march of quality, this is this is the uh, theme that I've been using from the beginning of this lecture. If you see, for example, if you see the uh, interaction of uh, various tools and techniques and the needs that uh, the, the the users of our economy they have come up with. In back in the old days, we had inspection as the only method for checking quality or assuring quality. Then, of course, we got into SPC, statistical process control. That grew into design of experiments. That then grew into Taguchi methods. Then we had quality management systems. We've already obtained a glimpse of that. TQM, ISO 9000, and QS 9000. Those come under quality management system. And the latest one on the frontier is Six Sigma. That's like another major uh, initiative that's uh, now it's bearing its fruits. So uh, that is there. Now, in all this, if you look at the state of services, where do services belong in all this? They are stuck right at the inspection stage. So most of services, their quality assurance is being done by inspection only. The moment of truth, this is something we got to realize that uh, the moment of truth occurs when there's a contact with the customer, when you actually deliver the service, that is the moment of truth. The moment of truth is when the customer is there in front of you and you're providing the service, that's the moment of truth. You know, your business can be broken right there or the business can actually pick up some leads to go on to a bigger, bigger uh, sort of uh, domain. You can grow and you can thrive and you can expand your market share and everything can happen if that, if you've acted right at the moment of truth. This is very important. What happens at the moment of truth? You end up with the ability to either satisfy or to dissatisfy the customer. This is actually very, very important. This is this is the event that takes place at the moment of truth when you got contact with the customers. And suppose you failed somehow, then many people, many services, they engage in what we call service recovery, which is like, uh, it's basically trying to satisfy someone who, is, who was previously dissatisfied as a result of the service that I provided. And uh, the idea here is, even if someone is not satisfied, Try to see if you could make him a loyal customer. So that's actually service recovery. Let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the other uh, areas in this. 
something that you got to remember that is true for services, it is not so true for other areas. For example, it is not true for uh, manufacturing and that is the perishability of service. It is difficult actually to synchronize service, the supply of service with its delivery. It is very difficult to do that because you cannot store service. You cannot actually store hair cutting or something like that. It happens at the instant when there is a contact with the customers. And services also cannot be returned. You cannot put your hair back, uh, which I try sometimes, of course, when I go completely bald. Uh, when I'm at a uh, at a uh, place where they give me a haircut, and if it is, if they come too close to this, there is no way I can put some hair back unless I use a topi, of course. Now, services therefore cannot be returned or resold. Once you provided someone a service, he has already consumed it, so there is no question of reselling that service. And something else we have got to remember, today the customer is looking for the total experience. What is this total experience? Let us take a look at the automotive sector for example. What we have here is, we have the product aspect, we have the product aspect of the automotive business. And if you look at the total acceptance criteria, this is like the criteria that customers would use to continue to do business with you if you are in the auto sector for example. There is the product aspect and you can actually see. As far as the product is concerned, we, we really view the auto itself to be the, the automobile itself as the product. Performance is there, certain aspects of it have to be there in the right order. For example, with a car, everything should work, fit and the finish should be top notch. Ride should be good, handling of the vehicle should be good and the grade of the material used, for example, seat parts and so on, they also have to be top notch. This is like something that we expect to expect the product to have. This is the product aspect of performance. There is of course something that goes beyond just owning the uh, car. We also have to from time to time we have to take it back for uh, repair or, re, or uh, some other uh, care for example. And then I go to an auto repair shop and what all things are expected there? As far as the service component is concerned, we will be expecting that all work will be done as agreed at a price that also has been agreed upon. So, there is some reference there to the contract. The contract is actually when I sort of say that I require these services and I am quoted a price and if I like that deal, then of course, I ask him go ahead with it. How well that that part is uh, taken care of? And then in addition, I would also like to see friendliness of the people who are there, their courtesy for example and their competency in doing the job and quickness with which they do the job. These are now attributes of service attributes of service as far as performance is concerned, these are the performance attributes of the service that goes along with the product which is there. If you look at aesthetics, obviously there are a lot of things would like to uh, make sure the, the vehicle that I have purchased has for example, interior design, soft touch and so on and so forth. These are aesthetics, they go beyond just the functional requirements. As far as aesthetics in the work area is concerned or the auto shop, I would like the workplace to be clean. I would like the waiting area also to be clean. This is like something that I would like. I do not want to go to a place where the walls are greasy and so on and so forth. If I touch something, I get a stain of oil on my hand. That is not really a place I would like to go back to. So, there is like some aesthetics there. When, when you look at the service component, there are certain aesthetics that are also involved there. Special features. These special features actually convenience, for example. What kind of things do I want to see in a vehicle as convenience? These are special features certain gauges and their control, their, their placement. This is something very, very important. You also might like to have a cell phone in the car. You might like to have a CD player in the car. These are special features and these come in addition to the basic, basic features that come with the vehicle. What about special features in regard to, in regard to the uh, service of the, uh, of the vehicle? Location, where is it located? That is also very important. Call when ready, I should be able to call in and walk in and kind of drive in with my vehicle, that is something that I would like to be able to do. And also something that is a special feature, that is a major convenience is computer diagnostics or the availability of computer diagnostics. You can clearly see this is not a feature of the product. This is a feature of the guy who is providing that service that goes along with the vehicle. And I am looking at the total experience. Safety, what about safety in the vehicle itself? Anti-lock brakes, airbags, these are clearly safety features of the product itself. And what about uh, the service area? Well, there is a separate service area. I am not really around the vehicle 
when my vehicle is being worked upon and it has been you know jacked up on a, on a, on a some sort of a platform and there's there's a beam that raises the car and they are working underneath the car it should not be such that i'm exposed to any kind of danger there either something falling on my head or, or, or kind of damaging some property or, or my limbs and so on. That is not something I would like to have. I would like to have a safe area that is probably enclosed. Neither noise is there, not smoke is there and probably I can even rest there properly. So, that is like an area where I feel safe if I have gone in there for a service. Let us also take a look at one or two other areas. For example, reliability and we all know that there are certain things we require when we buy a vehicle we would like to have as few breakdowns as possible and they should not be too frequent. That is a product feature. What about liability in terms of the work done on my vehicle? Work done correctly so that I do not have to come back and get, get the thing done again, get the repair done again and also liability in regard to time. So, there is the quality of that service and also ready when promised. This gives me the time dimension and both of these things if they are done right, I, I regard that auto repair shop to be a reliable one. Then we we'll look, look at reliability and then of course, we can it is very easy for us to see that we for the vehicle we must have useful life in miles or kilometers and also it should resist rust formation and corrosion that is something I would like to have the vehicle itself to have that is a product feature. On the service side the work holds up over time it is not that I take it home and again I have the same problem or I drive it for a week and then again I have got the same nagging problem that is actually is telling me that the repair that was done was not durable. So, that is a service component. Then of course, uh, perceived quality how is that uh, how is my car perceived and as far as the product is concerned, I obviously clearly would be much happier if we drove the top rated car like the Toyotas or the Hondas or the Mercedes or the BMWs that is what we would like to be able to drive. That is like that is a product image of the car itself that is perceived uh, quality. On the service front, I would like to go to a place who have been recognized for award winning service. That actually gives me some assurance that these people they are good people to do business with and that is now like a service component. So, I have got a product component and then I also have a service component in regard to my vehicles perceived quality and then service after sale. As far as the product is concerned, I would like to know if I have a problem with my vehicle, if I call in, how are they handling the complaints, what, what, what kind of things do they have in terms of information management. If I have a complaint, do they write things down and so on, do they do a follow up and so on. That is a feature of the product. On the service side, again handling of complaints. If I am not happy with the service that was provided, uh, do I see a follow up? Notice here, I have got both the product component and I have got the service component and I am looking at the total satisfaction, I am looking at the total experience to derive my satisfaction. Therefore, not only the product, but also service has become part and parcel of doing good business and we got to ensure, ensure quality in both. Looking specifically into services and if we look at look into for example, reliability, if you look at reliability, something that we got to remember is when it comes to reliability, performing the product promise service, that is something that is uh, regarded to be reliability. I, I, the service facility provided uh, me some service and uh, they, they, they provided exactly what they promised. Then of course, I regard, regard them to be uh, regard them to be reliable and they do it dependably and also they do it accurately. For example, let us take an example. I receive my mail at the same time every day and that is a reliable service. That is a reliable service. It is not that I am waiting for it or there is a surprise for me. It should not be like that. If it is like that, I cannot do my planning. So, if there is a if there is a for example, uh, you talk of FedEx, they have a specified pickup time and there is no confusion about it. Then of course, responsiveness, this is also a very important dimension of service quality. That is the willingness to help customers promptly. They respond exactly when we need them. This is very important because this avoids keeping customers waiting for no, no apparent reason. This is also something that is very important in terms of managing a service. If you want to really if you want to be known as one who provides excellent service, do make sure you, you are reliable and also you are responsive. There are some other aspects also, for example, assurance. I should be able to assure, I should be able to convey trust and confidence. When the customer comes and deals with me, I should be able to convey trust and confidence to him. This is very, very important. 
And also an example is uh, being polite and showing respect for the customer. This actually is a, is a kind of an assuring thing that, uh, you know, trust me, I'll take care of you. And, uh, you know, I respect your business. I respect you as a person and I'll take care of you. This actually shows that I'm trying to build trust. And this gives the customer also some reason to do business with me instead of going out to, to, a, to, a, to a competition, for example. Empathy, which is like I'm approachable. If I'm providing service, I'm approachable. If something has gone wrong, I can listen. I'm willing to listen. This is also something very, very important in the provision of services. Then there are occasions when I provide not just the service, I also provide some tangible things in addition. And I got to make sure whatever tangibles I provide, the physical facilities I provide, for example, or other goods that I provide, they are clean, for example, and there are there are reasons to believe when it's a combination of a product and a service, people will view both of them. People would like to evaluate both of them before they really judge to tell me that, yes, uh, this is a this is a business that I'd like to do business with. This is a business entity that I'd like to continue to do business with. So tangibles are also important. Now, if you look at uh, if you look at the mix of tangible products, and if you look at uh, the mix of uh, uh, some some parts of intangible products, it turns out most services most services comprise some tangible components and some intangible components. Of course, there is a full spectrum. There are there are some businesses which are purely tangible and there are some businesses that are purely intangible. Let us take a look at that. You go to the slide there, soft drinks, salt, detergents and so on, they tend to be, they are also providing me some sort of satisfaction. They are, they are provisions that I use and they are tangible dominant. The, the tangible product itself is the dominating thing. As you slowly move toward the right, you will find cosmetics, care and so on, fast food outlets. The moment you come to fast food outlets, it is a combination of the tangible product and also the service that is provided, the quickness with which service is provided, the accuracy with which they, they check your change and so on and so forth and the care that they show when you show up at the counter for example or you could be driving and you just wind down your window and then you sort of you know place your order and you count out the money you give it to them and you drive up then and you go to the counter that is the pickup counter and you can again you wind down your window and you grab the thing and you move off. This is very important for us to realize there is a there is a product component, obviously the food that you obtain and also the service that is going with it. So as far as fast food is concerned, there is a tangible component and also there is an intangible component. It is the combination that we are looking at and in many cases it is about 50-50 in such businesses. Then you got advertising agencies which in most cases it is not much tangible, most of it is most of it is actually it turns out to be intangible. It is the feeling that you have how the message was conveyed, how convincing it was and so on and so forth, that is an intangible thing and it is very possible that if you look at airlines, investment management, consulting and so on and certainly when it comes to teaching, you hardly deliver anything that is physical. I uh, do not provide pens and papers in every class, I do not do that. So there is hardly anything tangible that is passed on to, passed on to my students when I am teaching. Most of it is intangible, it is coming across, it is coming across, you cannot touch it, you can't, you can feel it, but you can't touch it, you can't store it, you can't do anything with it as far as teaching is concerned. That is knowledge, that is uh, for example, information and knowledge that is passed on and it is an intangible. So, if you look at the full spectrum, we again start with variety of businesses are there, some are totally tangible and many are totally intangible and many businesses of course, they are in this full spectrum, they go from left to right as you increase the share of intangible you move from left to right, that is where you are. So, most businesses, they will have to then worry about some part of the intangibles also. It is very, very important for us to realize. Now, what what is a, exactly determines customer satisfaction? All customers really want to be satisfied. I do not know any customer. If you are spending some time, if you are paying someone for some product or service, I do not know anyone who would not, not like to be satisfied. I walk in with a certain need in mind and I'd like to walk away having that need uh, satisfied. This is what I'd like to be able to do. In fact, uh, customers are loyal only because they cannot go somewhere else, either for price or for the quality of service or for the quality of the goods. They would not go somewhere else because they get value with me which they cannot get somewhere else. If I would not be able to provide the value that somebody else offers, obviously the customer is not going to come to me. That is something we've got to remember. So, in fact, it's
very very important for us to find a way to provide customers some extra value. This may delight or even exceed their uh, expectation and this may cause them to come back and this is exactly what we are after. We are after customers coming back to us. Not only they themselves come back but they also tell others, their friends and relatives and so on that uh, this is one good place. If you go there, I think they will take care of you. I think they will give you good value. That is something that we have to do. Now, how do we find out? How do we find out exactly what things are satisfying, what things are delighting and what things are just basic needs? There is a there is a model that was formulated by a gentleman who is Professor Kano, a Japanese. He was actually a student of Ishikawa. He came up with this Kano model. It is a great way to approach this issue of satisfaction and we will catch a glimpse of that as we go along in this uh, talk here. How serious is uh, one particular thing which is called the uh, customer feedback and word of mouth? How serious is this? Couple of things I would like to be able to uh, uh, mention here. I'd, uh, the average business owner hears only about four percent from four percent of the customers who are dissatisfied. Very few people would actually bother complaining. Even if they are not satisfied, they would not bother complaining. They would probably just live with it. Ninety-six percent do not really bother complaining, and actually, out of, out of them, the ninety-six percent who are not satisfied, twenty-five percent probably have pretty serious problems with what I have given them either in terms of a product or a service. 4 percent complainers are more likely to stay with the supplier, only 4 percent than the 96 percent who do not complain. So, now you are looking at a different spectrum. You are looking at all those people who have not complained, but they are not satisfied for some reason. If somebody has complained, only 4 percent of these people, they would stay with it. It is very, very unfortunate that without that we really would have a big, big uh, you know uh, big problem to handle. First of all, very few people complain and those who complain very, of, very, very few of them actually continue to do business with me. 60 percent complainers would stay as customers if the problem was solved and 95 percent would stay if the problem was resolved quickly. That is also something that we got to remember. Those who have complained if the problem was resolved quickly, 60 percent of them would stay with us. And if the problem was resolved quickly, not only it was resolved, it was resolved quickly, then 95 percent people who actually had a complaint, they would not mind staying and doing business with them. But if you have a dissatisfied customer, that means someone who did not get satisfied, he is going to tell between 10 and 20 other people that this is not a good place to go for your service or your or purchase your product. And remember, even if you are doing retail purchasing, there is a lot of human contact, a lot of intangibles going on. In fact, that is the game of salespeople. Salespeople offer these intangibles, the experience of purchasing and they make you feel like you have made the best decision ever possible. That is the kind of thing that we are looking at. If you are able to combine that along with your product, you are a winner. And the customer who has actually got a problem will probably go around telling other people also and that statistics also there and we cannot really deny this. If you look at the uh, ratings, these ratings go from 1 to 10 and uh, the degree of severity with which a customer is going to complain about something. The if, if severity is pretty low which is like 1, then the customer will not at all observe the, there, is a, there is a problem with it and the likelihood of that particular complaint happening is very remote that is also there. Then of course, the comp in, in uh, rating 2, this is like a level of dissatisfaction that is rising. The customer will experience some slight discomfort, but again, it is something he can probably live with. And uh, then of course, we have got customer will experience some annoyance because of some degradation is there in performance and so on and so forth. If you move on this chart, for example, I will just leave it for you to read. There are occasions where the customer is going to be downright dissatisfied. Like for example, rating 5 customer is uncomfortable and this is a moderate rate of failure and uh, I may have some documentation for it and uh, it may actually lead to what we call potential failure. This is like something that would not, we would not be able to, able to we would not be able to uh, sort of live with. Then of course, I have got something called warranty repairs. Warranty repairs actually means that the product has, product has failed or perhaps even the service had some problem with it. This is of course, a fairly serious situation. It is about halfway to going out of business. 
then I've got even higher degree of customer dissatisfaction when perhaps I've done some damage to the customer's own operation. Perhaps I inflicted some damage on him or his property. At a severity rate eight, I've really caused a very high degree of customer dissatisfaction. Then of course, I've caused some negative impact on the customer and that's going to be at rating nine and uh, at rating 10 of severity of poor service that would mean a negative impact on the customer, people and society and this is going to guarantee failure for you and actually this is like uh, a situation when perhaps the controls that you have in place they are not able to detect that there is going to be a potential failure because you intentionally would not cause a, cause a situation like this. So most likely you are not able to detect. So this third fourth column here is the ability for you to be able to detect if you are providing that service. Let's take a look at uh, some of the other things that can be done. First of all, we got to recognize that there are five dimensions in which uh, quality is being looked at and particularly if it is service. People are looking at reliability, people are looking at responsiveness, people are looking at empathy, people are looking at assurance and people are also looking at tangibles compounded with, combined with, packaged with or bundled with a service that you are offering. Something you also have to recognize when we are trying to design a facility to provide good services, we got to recognize the quality gap. This I bring up in the next slide. The next slide talks about this. That's very important for us to be able to diagnose the problem. What do I fix? Where is the gap and what do I fix? That's something that's going to be clear once we get into that gap analysis. And something else we can do, we can also do QFD. You remember we did QFD for product design and also we did it for process design. Here we are trying to bring in QFD for service design. For example, there are a lot of services that are being provided now with uh, your cell phones. Cell phones are now providing a lot of services. And now what kind of services will you provide? You can design that using QFD. That's also like a great way to make sure you maximize service satisfaction with the service. You can also use the Kano model, which I'm going to mention as we go into it a little later. And that will help you prioritize the different services that you'll be providing the customer which are aimed at taking care of certain types of uh, requirements. I could, I could also collect some data and I could construct what we call a process control chart, which is like a chart that will monitor how performance is going on. That's something I could do. I could also, in case something does go wrong, I could do something that is called service recovery, which is like I take a dissatisfied customer, I do some special things so that he turns into a loyal customer. I do something, maybe I do a refund without question, unconditional return and an um, unconditional guarantee type of thing. I, I extend something that is beyond that because I, I do not really worry so much about the, the business that I have lost just at this moment. I want to make sure that it comes back to me. And another thing I could do when I am trying to improve uh, quality, quality of services is I do a walk through the full chain of service. From the time I have input of materials and goods and so on and so forth provisions, and then I've got the customer entering the system. I trace it all the way from the beginning to the end till the customer leaves my premises. I do this walkthrough. That also is going to, it's like an audit that can bring out a lot of things which probably would stay hidden otherwise. Let's take a look at this quality gap model. Notice here the beginning is of course is customer expectation. That is the, that is the beginning of everything. So I've got that yellow box there, customer expectation. That is the start of everything. Where do I find this out of? This is done of course through marketing research. Market research will find this out. So customer market research and you try to, what is your effort? You try to understand the customer. Then you come up, come up with your own perception about customer expectation. There are real expectations. You have your own perception. If there's a gap between these two, you'd not be able to satisfy that customer there. So this is gap number one, very important. Then of course, management has some some perception and on the basis of that the, the managers they go about designing the service. So you, now you design that service. So the first step was you understand the customer, try to understand what his, what his expectations are. Then you design the service that will take care of those uh, requirements, those expectations. And there of course I, I generate as a result of this, I generate some standards. These are service standards. Again, if there is a gap between what the, what my perception was 
my perception as a manager, someone who is going to provide that service and the service standards that I set, if there is a gap between these two, which is our gap number two, if that gap is too wide, then the again I have the perception, but I have not designed a service that will take care of uh, taking care of those perceptions. There is going to be a gap there. So, my service design has been defective there. That is how I get to my service standard. Then of course, I have my service standards that is like something that is expected. Then I have got this major job of delivering that service. That is also something very, very important for us. So, there I go from I go from service standards to service delivery. Now, I have to make sure that service standards are met by the service that I deliver. So, this is a, this is an issue of conformance. If there is a difference between what I deliver and what the service standards are, these are like your specifications. If there is a gap there and of course, there is a gap of conformance. This is gap number 3. And again, if this, this gap is wide, I am not going to get customer satisfaction. I am not certainly going to get customer delight. <coughs> then from service delivery to customer perception. I offered a service or I offered a particular product or I offered that bundle of service and product. I offered that. But the customer when he received it, he had a certain perception. He was expecting something and now he is perceiving the quality of what I have offered to him. If there is a gap between what I deliver and what he perceives it to be, there is again a gap there. That is gap number 4 and that is a matter of have I communicated? Have I communicated with him properly? So, his perceptions are straight, uh, perceptions are right. In fact, this is when I am trying to manage basically his perception because I have done everything possible to the extent I could. I have done, I have tried to understand the customer, I have tried to uh, try to design the service correctly, I have set stand, standards for it, I have tried to make sure I deliver to those specs and then of course, I am also trying to communicate and I am trying to make sure the, that he, his perception is exactly what I intended it to be. So, I deliver some service and I want to make sure that is what he perceives it to be. If that gap is there in the end again, then of course, I have got again a gap to, to worry about and I will not really have a delight, delight, delighted customer. Then of course, the last part is customer perception versus what the customers are expecting. The customers are expecting certain things. When he started doing business with me, he conveyed or through, through market research perhaps, I found out what is it that he is after. When he has received the service or the, the package, the package that is the, the bundle of the service and the product that I offered to him, he ended up with a perception. If there is a gap now between what he perceives this delivery to be and what his expectations are or were, that gap again is something very serious. So, the gap between what he perceived the delivery to be and what he was expecting, this gap again, if it is too wide, I will not have a satisfied customer. There again, I have to manage this. So, again, there is a, there's, so there are five gaps here and each of these gaps to be, have to be understood and we got to make sure we identify where that gap is and we try to do the, uh, we take the uh, steps to correct that. That is something we got to do. How do we do that? How you actually, how do we go about designing the kind of service that we want? To begin with, I have got to make sure that I design the service package that fits the requirement. For example, uh, there is a hotel in India. This is uh, the Taj group of hotels and uh, most of the hotels that they manage are 5 star hotels, 5 star or 6 star or 7 star. They are really top notch world class hotels. Now, a lot of travelers, even if they are business travelers, they do not have unlimited budget. So, they would like to get very good comfort, no doubt. But certainly, they are not looking to get a 5 star experience. If they go to Delhi, then they go to Jaipur, then they go to Bombay, then they go to Ahmedabad, then they come back to Delhi. They have done these 3, 4 city trips. They are not really looking to get a 5 star experience in all those places. This is something that the Taj group recognized and they came up with a series of hotels that are not the top of the line 5 star tier, but they also provided very good service, excellent service and most of the stuff that they would do in, in the 5 star hotel, they provided same quality of service at a lower price because they could really see there was a large market here and this could not be really taken care of by offering the, offering the, the travelers the uh, 5 star comfort and the 5 star uh, provisions. So, that is something where it was recognized that the uh, design had to be fitting 
the requirements. So there is like, like right now, we are really what we are really trying to do is we are trying to make sure that the design fits the requirement. Then there is something called robust design, and robust design is something where if something fouls up, the system takes care of it. Now robustness is something that we always take care of when we are looking at, uh, for example, tangible products. We worry about robust design, but there is robust design. The robust design is also possible in services. For example, you have got everything there, everything you have provided and uh, for some reason, uh, you know, there are certain hours at which time the maid go in, they tie up the, the bed sheets and everything else, they, you know, change the flowers and so on, they clean the ashtrays and so on. They do this at certain prescribed hours. These are preset hours. Now, suppose there is a customer and he is expecting a small meeting to be held in his suite and he wants the room to be tidied up. Now, if your system was so fixed that only at certain hours like 7.30 in the morning, then again probably around 11.30, then again around 5.30, then again around maybe probably 8.30, the, the maid would come in and she would tidy up the place. If, the, if these times were fixed and suppose the visitor is coming at 10.30 and there is some ash laying in the ashtray, the, 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 the fellow who is, the, the guest is not going to feel very good about this. So, what he would like to be able to do is if he knows that the meeting is going to start at uh, 10 30, probably around 10 or maybe around 10 15, he would like to buzz the uh, desk downstairs. He would probably say, Oh, could you please send the maid? I uh, would like it to be just a little tied up. I have got a small meeting uh, to be held in this suite again. Now, here there is robustness, the system is robust. What happened at uh, you know that extra ash that was there? It is a noise, but the system is able to take care of that noise there. So, I have got a robust design. What is the robustness that are provided here? I have got some extra capacity, I have got some extra people, extra maids who are on call and they do not do, they do their routine job, but in between there are some people who are assigned to attend the telephones just in case there is a house call. There, there is someone who is calling for some extra service in his room, I have got that provided for it. So there is a robustness built into the system. Then there is a provision called Pokayok. Pokayok actually talks about fail setting and I will give you a couple of examples of this. For example, uh, Pokeyok is a, is a thing that uh, prevents mistakes. It is really designed, it is again a Japanese uh, procedure as you can really see from the title of it, Pokeyok. This is a Japanese phrase. It really says that, uh, you know, it, the implication is that I will make sure that a mistake is not made when the service is provided, for example, it is done right. Then of course, the quality, you know, use of QFD, quality function deployment and Kano model. These are also tools with which I can maximize my customer satisfaction. Let us take a look at uh, Pokeyok opportunities and I am going to give you some very specific opportunities here. Uh, for example, if you have got uh, a server, he is going to be taking care of some customers and uh, he does the, uh, the instance of an error is that the server does the work incorrectly. For some reason, he fails to do the job right. And it is also possible that uh, he fails to listen to the customer, this is also possible. This is again a mistake that is, uh, you know, that the uh, server, the person who is providing the service, he is committing. It is also very possible that the server or the, if this is a service facility, he fails to wear clean uniform. That is also something that is a Pokayok type of situation. Customer errors, failure to bring necessary materials at an ATM. For example, you walk into the ATM and you forgot your card or probably you forgot that little piece of slip on which you have written your, your uh, secret code. You, you misplaced it somewhere or it is not there. You walked in there, but you do not have the necessary materials or perhaps uh, you would like to probably uh, pay a bill or something and many ATMs they take deposits, uh, but perhaps you have not brought your pen or something like that. So again, you have you've, you've forgotten to bring something essential that is with you. Encounter, it is also very possible that you are not able to follow the system flow which is there and that is also a problem sometimes and uh, sometimes of course, we are not able to resolve the problem. So, there is a, if there is a problem there, you are not able to signal and therefore, you cannot really have the uh, thing resolved. These are opportunities where mistake proofing can be done and I am going to give you some examples. Uh, what is it that Six Sigma tries to do? Six Sigma is trying to do two things, two things Six Sigma is trying to do. The first thing Six Sigma is trying to do is, 
it is trying to reduce losses. Any time you have losses, loss of material, loss of money, loss of time and perhaps even loss of satisfaction, Six Sigma will try to remove it, Six Sigma will try to reduce it. That is one thing. The second thing that Six Sigma tries to do is uh, basically you can think of it, it tries to reduce defects and it tries to reduce the defects certainly for hardware, it tries to cut them down to the level of parts per million defect which is like you know a few defects per million parts inspected. That is the level at which Six Sigma tries to get to. So, there is this variability reduction that is like one of the goals and in the context of service of course, what we have to do is we have to meet or exceed the customer's expectations and also we have to be consistent. If we are doing that, we are reducing variability. We are meeting consistently, we are meeting the expectation that is like something where I am bringing in consistency. So, I am reducing variability and also losses. Losses are generally caused when there is delivery, when there is like a failure to deliver service or failure to deliver a material or we have deviations in time or we have actually we cause some monetary loss. That is like a loss. Again, I would like to minimize that as much as possible. So, as far as services go, I can have variability reduction by providing consistent service. That is like one place. I am going to give you some examples. I am going to give you a very large example that has come from a bank that actually was still at the level of inspection only, but they did certain things that approach the uh, philosophy of Six Sigma. The second thing that I would also like to do in a service is I would like to any kind of loss that the service may cause, I would like to minimize that. Let us take a look at how this was done in one particular company, one particular uh, place where they, their job really was to uh, manage a credit union. This particular credit union, it happens to be uh, located in Texas. And uh, the office that I interacted with, where I got some of this data from, they are in Dallas. They are in the town of Richardson, which is just outside uh, Dallas. The uh, credit union is called Community Credit Union. They also call themselves CCU. They began their uh, Six Sigma in quotation. They were really not trying to get to parts per million defect. They were not trying to get there, but they were trying to adopt the philosophy of Six Sigma to try to raise customer satisfaction. What did they uh, try to do? What did they actually uh, want to do? The things they wanted to do was to try to make sure that uh, certain things were done for the customer to assure a high level of satisfaction. This is something they would like to be able to do. What they did was they did an extensive customer survey. They did first they did brainstorming and from that they made a long list of things. Perhaps all these things the customers would be looking for, then they did an actual survey. And the result of the survey was they wanted to make sure that they, that they captured all those things that were valued by the customer. So, this would also involve doing a bit of QFD. And what they found was there were three things people were looking for. People who did uh, you know transactions with this particular credit unit, they were looking for three different things or three different angles of service delivery. Certainly, there were certain technical things people were looking at. Almost a third of the people they wanted to make sure that the technical knowledge was there in the employees of this credit union, which is like a bank, that the skills to be able to do the job. And of course, their service quality was good and professional. This was rated slightly higher than uh, technical knowledge. And they were also, they came across as professionals. And the third thing that customers also uh, you know pointed out was that there should be teamwork type of thing. So, if there is something where one particular employee is stuck, people should be able to provide that. And you have got to remember that we are looking at all the stakeholders of this business and some of those stakeholders also include people who work in the back room. So, they certainly would appreciate if this teamwork, if the spirit of team, teamwork is built, they would also appreciate that. So, these were the things that were pulled from the surveys. Now, what did they find in terms of details? In terms of technical knowledge and details, they found several things. And they did set targets for it. They wanted to make sure that they put some specs out there, and these specs were such that uh, if they were met, they would really have, they would end up having a delighted customer. Over or short, this is like a count that the teller makes at the end of uh, a day, and that should not be more than $300 per year. 
and that would be given a weight of 25 percent in terms of technical skills or knowledge. No more than 12 times a year uh, the till should be out that is like something that also uh, was important for the uh, for the good conduct of the uh, business here. Balance within 30 minutes after the last member has been helped and uh, and all the corrections have been done and that should be done within 30 minutes. So, after the last customer has been helped within 30 minutes I should be able to do my balance. This is also something that is an indication of good service by this bank. Average minimum teller transactions per month there is a certain minimum level they, they set and they said this must be this must be met and uh, that also is a standard. Then of course, there were certain errors that were controllable by the uh, by the tellers themselves these are employees in the company in the uh, credit union. The errors found on non cash audit errors found on non cash audit that is something that would like to be able to do errors in logging errors detected by member calls if a member means the members of the credit union if they call in and they say that there is a certain mistake that I found that also should be there should be some monitoring of that and errors found during out of, out of balance searches this also is something there. Any kind of reversal I have to do for a transaction many times you might have noticed that a bank does a reversal of a transaction because somebody made a mistake somebody in the bank he entered into your account when he should have probably entered the uh, either the amount either a deposit or a withdrawal it should not have gone to your account but it affected your account by mistake. Then of course, repetitive errors the same error was repeated that is also something that we like to be able to do. Then force balancing this is also something that uh, for which really the, these these errors they were an indication of the level of satisfaction. Something more of course, we got to make sure we also understand that service quality and professionalism these are also things and uh, what we would like to be able to do is uh, would like to be able to do uh, uh, certain things that are uh, important for the customer. For example, there is a rating provided to people and that rating should be at least 3 it is from it goes from 1 to 5 and these are feedbacks provided by various people and many of these are uh, they are members of the trade union they provide feedback on you know what their rating was, what how, how satisfied they felt when they were dealing with a particular teller at a counter that that count that is something that you can just check in a box when you are leaving the bank you could probably say service was okay it was delightful it was not so good and so on and so forth. So, threes at a certain level they wanted to make sure that uh, the average was at least at three and no more than two controllable negative complaints. This is the complaint that resulted because the error could have been could have been controlled by the uh, credit to any person, but it was not done. So, there, there is a, again a particular limit set there and no more than one counseling session about dress code per year you understand what I mean by that. You know the dress the dress of the person should be such that it is presentable because you are dealing with the public after all why is it that bankers dress so well. Because you know people walking in to try to do some financial transactions with them because they are going to trust their money to these people. They certainly do not want to do this if the place looks shabby, if the people dressed look shabby and so on, but they, they would not like to do that. So, therefore, it is kind of a, almost a must for bankers to always have a you know uh, white shirt and nice dark tie and dark suit and everything, polished shoes and uh, really a you know kind of a perfect professional kind of look that is what they would like to present. And I have noticed that in, in, in uh, ladies as well, they, they are really immaculately dressed, it gives a sense of trust and you, know, you trust the person when it is so well you know his get up is so good you, you begin to trust that person and that puts you at a, at a kind of at a comfortable level to do the transaction. Then of course, teamwork that was also there also a target was set and there the complaints would not be more than two uh, true complaints coming from your peers about you that uh, she was rough or she was rude or whatever it was or she did not help me or she it could even be that she did not wait for me when I was leaving for home and there was no public transport available and uh, she just left she knew I was the last person in the room in the in the office or in the bank but she left a few small things like that they may appear to be small but they can be pretty uh, nasty sort of and no more than 6 absences per year this is also something that is like a teamwork it it actually implies that you care. So, there were these 3 areas where quantitative targets were set many more quantitative targets were set and I am going to be showing that to you on this slide here 
I, I, I'd actually what I would do is I'd leave this here for a couple of minutes for you and just take a look at what these uh, various things are. There is the criteria and I call this the rubric. What is a rubric? Well, many times we teachers, we teachers, we uh, would give an exam and uh, there is the chance of making a judgment. There is the chance of making a judgment on the answers. Are the answers just perfect? Are they just fine? They are probably not perfect, but they are excellent or they are very good or they are good or they are satisfying or they are downright unsatisfactory and so on. So, there is a rubric that actually defines these levels. I have the similar type of rubric defined here on the screen there. Notice here the criteria is given, criteria is over or short. What is unsatisfactory? This is like over or short 500 dollars per year. And what is significantly exceeding the requirements? Never over or short. And then, of course, I've got exceeds requirements. That is like when it comes to, uh, you know, making sure you're under three hundred dollars. That is the target here. Over or short, ninety-nine or less per year. That's like exceeding requirements. Meeting requirements would be being over or short, like a hundred. Then, of course, if I'm over or short between three hundred one dollars and four hundred ninety-nine dollars. I am below requirements and so on and of course, if I am over or short beyond 500 dollars, my performance is unsatisfactory. And similarly, I have got the provision for out of balance, balance within 30 minutes, controllable errors, teller transactions, average feedback scores, member complaints, dress code, peer complaints and so on and forth. All of these have already been listed in the previous slide there. And what I have done here is I have provided, I have taken away that subjectivity, I have taken away the subjectivity. And here I have come up with a rubric, a rubric basically tells you how do you judge, it gives you objectivity. You make a measurement based on, you make an evaluation based on exactly what is what you are able to see or measure and therefore, it becomes much more objective and there is no argument then because these standards are clear and I am not talking about, I am not talking about manufacturing anymore, I am talking about doing QFD, doing the Kano model and everything else, setting standards, making sure I understand them. And I've set quantitative standards here, and this can be done. The moment you start plotting something, by the way, the moment you start plotting any of these uh, parameters on a scale, people would like to keep the chart low. People like to see it trending downward. So the moment you start collecting data, it's been seen over and over that people start watching what they are doing. Some good practices in the management of service quality. The the very first thing that uh, has been pointed out is. Uh, Try to make sure cost of quality is kept as low as possible and that would be done if you reduce internal failures, rework and scrap and so on. If you reduce external failures which is returns from customers and probably the, so the damage that has been done to the customer outside. Of course, you also like to, you would also like to minimize the inspection. So, these are the three things you would like to reduce which is like reduce internal errors, internal losses you would like to reduce external losses, you would like to also reduce inspection. How do you do that? Well, you spend money on prevention. If you spend money on prevention, you are going to be able to do this. This is Joran's philosophy. Service process control, this is like you start monitoring things. This is also something that would give you data and it would naturally become something that you could then slowly move toward what we call SPC. And there are companies that actually do SPC charting. They, they produce the number of defects, for example. For example, if you are looking at a uh, a room, a hotel room, somebody comes along before the uh, room is uh, certified to be okay to be uh, given to a guest. Somebody comes along and he checks, uh, he has got a big checklist with him and he walks around with the checklist and he ticks certain things and the number of ticks that he makes that are like not satisfactory, that can be charted, that can be put in a control chart and it can be done. And then of course, there is the provision of unconditional service guarantee. This again is like another vehicle by which I could delight. I could delight a customer, I could do that. So, what is it that I would like to be able to do? If you look at the cost of quality component, for example, I would like to be able to minimize failure costs. I would like to minimize external failure costs. I would also like to be able to minimize internal failure costs. I would also like to be able to minimize detection costs. These are generally through inspection. These are the things that I would like to minimize. How do I do that? By spending money on prevention, which is like quality planning good training programs, quality audits done, all these have to be done in the provision of service. 
I am really not talking about product, production here, I am not talking about manufacturing. All this is to try to help manage a, uh, a service facility better. Data acquisition analysis, I collect data like we did in the case of that credit union. We had various uh, categories in which data could be collected and these could be tabulated. A database could be built and so on and so forth. That could help in the management of quality. Then of course, recruitment and selection and supplier evaluation. Now, something you got to remember in the provision of service, your supplier is generally the worker. He's your, he's your, he's your, uh, he's basically your, uh, you know, a supplier. So, the, the, how you, what kind of people do you recruit? That's something that we could take a look at. Service process control that also can be done. You start with customer input. Then, of course, you make sure you design the service process appropriately. Then, the experience is going to be the customer's output. You, you, you take your resources and you take customer's input, which is in terms of requirements, and you produce the service, and then you've got the uh, customer, customer output there. And this is to be monitored. And then you've got your own service concept with the basis of which you've got some standards set. And then you compare the two and you come up with uh, reasons for any kind of non conformance that is there and you take corrective action. If you're doing this, you're doing service process control. This is a lot like what we did in our uh, manufacturing situation when we're doing DMAC. We were doing DMAC for Six Sigma. So, this is like another way to emulate the philosophy of Six Sigma. I defined, I measured, I then I analyzed, I improved, and then I set some control mechanisms. I have done the same thing D M A I C, and I am doing Six Sigma now in the provision of service. I will continue with our series. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.